16 years ago, I started seminary, and no one said this outright, but you kind of got this from the undercurrents, especially among more of the ladies, that when you were in college and you were single, the best bet would probably have been to found someone, found a boyfriend, if you're a, a guy, to found, find a girlfriend, and then by the time you graduated from college to have gotten married, because you just, you know, you want to be able to do that. And so when you got to seminary, which at the seminary where I attended, most of the students were about 24 to 30 years old. That was the age gap. And so they were a little older um, as far as students are concerned. And there was this undercurrent of, this is our last chance to get married here. I mean, this, this is it. And so, and I'm not saying I agree with that, but, but you kind of just got this sense of urgency, you know? We're, we're 25, 26, 27. We're in school. This is a three-year program. And so if I, I miss the whole college marriage thing, so I've got to do it now at seminary. And so every year the seminary would put on this event in late August and it was a big party, a big feast where all of the current students and all the incoming students would have this big, this big event. Now I hate to use such crass terms, but it ended up being kind of a looking around for fresh meat sort of thing. You know, I've been to seminary one year and I haven't found anybody yet, but there's a flock of new students coming in. And so you could just kind of tell there was a buzz in the air with this uh, event in late August that occurred every year. There was extra makeup and extra time with hair, extra time spent on the dress. And you could just kind of, you could walk in and you could sense, man, they, these people are ready to get down. I mean, they're not playing games anymore. They mean business. And, I, you know, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think, I think unless we've been called to be single, I think God wants us to get married and to, and to have families and to raise up according to Genesis 12 and 18 and send out godly offspring. But you could just sense the buzz in the air, and it was pretty cool because you could sit back and you could see, okay, he's whispering about to her about that person, and he's looking over there. Oh, that's clearly his wingman. And you can just watch all this stuff going on, right? And, 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 then, and they're having these conversations and stuff, and you can see people are blushing. But then the event ends. You're walking down school the next, the next week, and you see two people that were talking on that event, and now they're walking down the, the aisles or the, the hallways together. Oh, I see and you always see them together, and next thing you know, they're, they're holding hands, and they're together all the time, and then by the next year, there's been an engagement announcement, and, and so you get to watch this whole thing kind of unfold, and it was pretty cool to be a part of that. Well, you know, when you're in that phase, when uh, you, you have that infatuation phase, and they've tracked the chemicals and what this does to your brain, I mean, Romeo and Juliet, I mean, this is kind of normal behavior, right? Uh, unless there's some wisdom implanted into it. But we just, we, 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 we've met that person, and we just want to be with that person. They text, and we immediately respond, and they call, and we jump, and we go get it, and, and then we look forward to, I'm going to be sitting next to her, him in class, and, and this Saturday we're taking, and it's just, it's all of this stuff, this infatuation. Well, in the scripture, in the scripture, God has something kind of strange that he wants us to do. This is for men, for women, and for married people and unmarried people. There is a woman in the text with which God wants us to be infatuated. He wants us to connect with her. He wants us to spend time with her, to rub shoulders with her, to get to know her, to, if I may use the word, to date her, to court her. Just like the seminary students would get together, he wants us to get together with this woman, even if you're married. Now, somebody's like, well, what are you talking about? What kind of weird stuff is this? The woman of whom I speak in Proverbs chapter 8 is a woman we would describe as Lady Wisdom. You see, in the text, wisdom is personified as a woman. And God is calling us to go and to connect with her, to rub shoulders with her, and to learn from her. And so if you would, open up your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8. And we're going to be reading about this woman, this, this lady wisdom. We're going to be reading chapter 8, verse 1, all the way through the chapter, and up till a couple of verses in chapter 9. Uh, so... I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. Let's read about Lady Wisdom. Here's what the text says. Doesn't wisdom call out? 
Does an understanding make her voice heard? At the heights overlooking the road and at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates at the entry to the city and at the main entrance, she cries out, People, I call to you. My cry is to mankind, learn to be shrewd, you who are inexperienced. Develop common sense, you who are foolish. Listen, for I speak of noble things. And what my lips say is right, for my mouth tells the truth, and wickedness is detestable to my lips. And all the words of my mouth are righteous, none of them are deceptive or perverse. All of them are clear to the perceptive and right to those who discover knowledge. Accept my instruction instead of silver. And knowledge rather than pure gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and nothing desirable can compare with it. I, wisdom, share a home with shrewdness, and have knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil, and I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. I possess good advice and competence. I have understanding and strength. It is by me that... Kings reign and rulers enact just law. By me, princes lead, as do nobles and all righteous judges. And I love those who love me, and those who search for me find me. With me are riches and honor, lasting wealth and righteousness. And my fruit is better than solid gold, and my harvest than pure silver. I walk in the way of the righteous along the paths of justice, giving wealth as an inheritance to those who love me, and filling their treasuries. The Lord made me at the beginning. Of his creation. Before his works of long ago, I was formed before ancient times, and from the beginning, before the earth began, I was born. And there were no watery depths. When there were no watery depths and no springs filled the water, I was delivered before the mountains and hills were established, before he made the land, the field, or the soil on the earth. It was there when I when he established the heavens. I was there when he established the heavens, when he laid out the horizon on the surface of the ocean. When he placed the skies above, when the, founda- when the fountains of the ocean gushed out, when he set a limit for the sea so that the waters would not violate his command, when he laid out the foundations of the earth, I was a skilled craftsman beside him. I was his delight every day, always rejoicing before him. I was rejoicing in his inhabited world, delighting in the human race. And now, my sons, listen to me. Those who keep my ways are happy. Listen to instruction and be wise. Don't ignore it. Anyone who listens to me is happy watching at my doors every day, waiting by the posts of my doorway for the one who finds life and obta- the one who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. And the one who misses me harms himself. And all who hate me love death. Chapter nine, verse one. Wisdom has built her house. She has carved out her seven pillars, and she has prepared her meat and mixed her wine, and she has also set her table, and she has set out her female servants and calls out from the highest points of the city. Whoever is experienced, enter here. And to the one who lacks sense, she says, Come, eat my bread, and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave inexperience behind, and you will live. Pursue the way of understanding. As we continue our our journey through the book of Proverbs, I just want to remind us of a couple of things. We discovered last week that uh, the book of Proverbs is a collection of sage observations, a collection of sage observations about life in memorable form, and that really Proverbs deals with living in the gray. You see, so much of what we deal with every day is not about right or wrong. We do have right, and it's very clear, and we have wrong, and it's very clear, but it's that gray area in the middle. How do we thrive in that? And that's where wisdom and foolishness comes in. And so as we study the book of Proverbs, we're going to be talking about this gray area and and how we thrive. And so today we're talking about courting Lady Wisdom. Now, I want to talk about our learning approach for a minute. Some of you might be wondering, last week we began in chapter 1, and so why are we in chapter 8 this week? Well, most of us are Western thinkers. And what I mean is that our thought processes and our approaches tend to be sequential. The Apostle Paul was a sequential thinker. He wrote Romans, and there's a very clear progression of thought. You can see him building his argument. You can follow him logically from A to B to C. And as readers, we can outline that, and we can see where he's going for 12 chapters. 
But some people and some cultures are more clustered in their thinking. And so on the left, you have the sequential thinkers. They go from A to B to C, and they come to their conclusion. But the cluster thinkers, they're kind of more a little all over the place. They're more sp- spontaneous, more organic. Uh, and, and so they're kind of here, there, and they use all the information, and they come to a conclusion, but they just have a different approach. Well, Rather than going verse by verse through this book, which I think is counterintuitive to the text, we're going to survey the major themes, because the book is really clustered in the way it's designed. I'm not saying there's no structure, it's just not A, B, C, D going through. And so we're going to, we're going to kind of skip over these major themes, which will be supplemented by your faithful reading of the book of Proverbs. And last week we presented a challenge, and so if, you're, if you miss to listen online to the teaching time, but also to read three Proverbs a week for 13 weeks so that as we go through this, you're learning on your side, reading, and I'm teaching over here, and then we're all growing in faith and in wisdom. And then also for us to memorize uh, Proverbs 1-7, which is essentially the flagship verse uh, of this book. And so let's go back again. Uh, let's, let's say this together, okay? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of... Knowledge. Let's try that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. One more time. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now let's say it together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All right, we got one line down. We got that. So we're going to work on the next one next week. But it's real simple. And look, folks, if we tell our kids to memorize verses, I think we ought to be doing it ourselves. And maybe the brain isn't as fresh as it was, but this will get the, the neurons pumping and it will, get, it will keep the brain fresh. So let's get to Lady Wisdom. Who is this gal? Because if you look at verse 22 and on, it, ha- it, it creates kind of a strange sense of who this chick is because it talks about her being there at the beginning. It was almost like this is a fourth member of the Trinity. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then this Lady Wisdom, and she's been around for all this time. It says some strange things, that that, uh, she was formed in ancient times from the beginning, and that she was there when when there were no watery depths, and she was brought in before the mountains, and and he goes on to say um, uh, that... uh, that she was there when he established the heavens. And so we almost get this idea that, that maybe we've missed something. There's a trinity, but now there's a fourth person and we, we weren't paying attention. Well, it's not true. She's not a fourth member of the trinity because, well, you couldn't call it the trinity if there were four of them. Uh, but this is what's called, and I hate to use the technical terminology, but this is a literary device. This is called an anthropomorphism. It is a way to, to take an abstract concept like wisdom and to bring it down to make it more personal. And so what the author is doing is taking the concept of wisdom and turning it into a person as a way to make it memorable. And so it's a colorful, memorable way to say that God created the idea of wisdom from the very beginning, that he delights in wisdom, and that wisdom is a gift to us, humankind, and that we ought to be rubbing shoulders, connecting with wisdom. So there's no actual lady. It's a literary device. It's, this is literature. It's not just literature, but it is literature. And so we ought to connect with this gal. So how do we date her? How do we, how do we court this woman? Well, number one, in chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, we're to hear her call. It says that um, she takes her stand overlooking the crossroads. So maybe there's a, a hill and she looks down and, there, and there's a crossroads and caravans and travelers. They're all coming through. And she's up there shouting. She's saying, people, I call out to you. She's calling out. And in verse 4, it specifies that her cry is to mankind. And they used uh, gender-specific language, of course, uh, in the ancient world. But it's, it's inviting everyone, whether you're wise or foolish, young or old, male or female, she's calling out to everyone. She's standing on the mountainside, calling out to everyone. And, and we've got to hear her call. And here's the second thing, is we've got to listen to her words. Now, in verse 6, it says that she speaks of noble things. In verse 7, her mouth tells truth. Verse 8, all of the words of her mouth are righteous. Verse 10, we're to accept her instruction. Verse 14, she possesses good advice 
and competence. And so we hear her call, we listen to her words, but we also heed her warning. Verses 34 to 36, there are some very strong words here. And at the very end, she says, The one who sins against me, the one who sins against Lady Wisdom, harms himself. And then she says, All who hate me love death. If you hate wisdom, you love death. Because that's where it's going to end up. And finally, we're to hear her call, listen to her words, heed her warnings but were to feast at her table. Chapter 9, we find that this noble lady, Lady Wisdom, has built for herself a house. And not only that, she's prepared a meal. And this isn't any ordinary meal. Uh, She has servants, and she's serving meat and wine and bread. And this isn't fast food. This is a rich, noble feast consistent with someone of her station. In fact, there is such an abundance of food that she has these lady servants and she sends them out to the highest point of the city and they call out to invite anyone in the city who would come and eat at her table. And so this is an abundant feast. So the message of chapter 8 is that we're to, to get with Lady Wisdom, we're to hear her call, listen to her voice, heed her warnings, and feast at her table. But there is a difficulty here. You see, this, is, this lady is a motif. This is an ongoing analogy. So what does this mean practically? I mean, okay, so I get it. There's, there's wisdom personified as a woman, and we're to listen to this woman. But what does that actually mean? And so what I want to do is I want to give you some practical takeaways that are based sort of on the text. You might say, well, what do you mean sort of on the text? Well, what I mean is the text doesn't spell it out for us. If you were to have read this in the ancient world, it doesn't tell you exactly how to do this. Where do you find traction? And I think what Solomon would have intended is that we would have read this story and then sat there and thought about for a minute, what does it actually mean to to date or to court Lady Wisdom? So what I want to do is I want to share some things with you that will help us get traction on this idea of rubbing shoulders with wisdom herself. And so the first one is that I believe that we have to live a lifestyle where we read, study, memorize, and meditate on the Scripture. Now, if you've been in church for very long, this has been hammered over and over again, and it should be. This is Christianity 101. It's kind of like exercise. We all know that we need to exercise more. We all know that we need to eat more vegetables, that we need to eat less fast food or whatever it is, but we don't do it. And so me telling you this, all of you know this. It's just a matter of do we have the, do we have the um, encouragement to go out and actually do it. And so, folks, we are people of the book. Now, I like the way how lo- the Lord describes it to Moses. He's talking about the Old Testament, but I think the concept applies. This is what he says. Referring to the scripture, he says, These are not idle words for you. They are your life. These are not idle words for us. This is our life. And by the application and understanding of this book, will we live long in the land. This this isn't Shakespeare or Lord of the Rings, or Harry Potter, or Jane Austen, as if this is only just great literature and great entertainment. These are not idle words. It is literally by this that we are going to rise or fall. This is wisdom encompassed on the page. Now, some of you ladies here are married, and you have guys, and and you you know what it means when the box arrives from Amazon or wherever you ordered it, and it's some sort of shelf, bookshelf, kid's toy or bike. And there's two types of guys in the world. There are those that read the instructions and those that don't. You know how it is. You walk in, you see the box, he's tearing, it's all these parts, it comes with the little, little wrenches and stuff, and it's all crazy, and there's the instructions right next to him. But it doesn't matter, he can figure it out. And so you kind of step back and you just watch him, oh, okay, oh yeah. Oh yeah, he totally messed that up. And so you're just watching him do his own thing, and then eventually, maybe, maybe he's really mechanically cl- inclined and he gets it. But for me, every time I try to do it without the instructions, it bombs. 
And what I hate is that I'm good enough to think I know what I'm doing, but not really good enough to actually do it. And so what happens is uh, I start putting it together. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got this figured out. Who knows, needs those instructions, right? And I get it like 90% done, and I realize there was one little thing that I needed to insert in between these two pieces, and i got to take the whole dang thing apart and start over from scratch because I missed one step. Wisdom would simply say, look, I know you're smart. I know you're mechanically inclined. But why reinvent the wheel? The instructions are right there. Just follow along and do it. And so I kind of feel like this, 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 this is our instruction book. It's, it's all here. It, it talks about uh, marriage in here. It talks about uh, dating. It talks about uh, raising kids, family, daily life, uh, dealing with... I mean, it's all in here. And, and we, we come to church, and we, I'm a Christian, and we, and we say we're people of the book, and yet, and yet they, they, they just end up dusty, and we don't, we don't read them. And so when it comes to reading the text, I, I have heard various excuses over the years, and I want to go through a couple of them. Here's the first one. This is what I most often get. People will say, I'm not a reader. Now look, I, I have friends who are, who, I have a friend who literally cannot read. He, he, he's not a reader, and he literally cannot even spell out words. Okay? That's one thing. But m most of the time when people say this, they actually know how to read. They're just not readers. And what they mean is they just don't regularly read books. And I understand that. If you didn't grow up that way, that's hard. But what I would say is if something's important to you, you find a way to make it happen. Now, I think of it like this. I want you to imagine that you're fat, lazy, and out of shape. Okay? Now, for me, I don't have to really imagine that much. Okay? But let's say I have a friend who says, I've been going to CrossFit, my body percent fat is down to like 0 0.1, I, I, I'm in the Olympics now because of, I mean, all this crazy stuff they can do, they've got the washboard abs, they're so muscular that their six pack has become an eight pack, I mean, this is that great, right? And so they invite you to come to CrossFit. Now, I wouldn't recommend that if you're fat, lazy, and out of shape because you do have a heart muscle and enough strain is going to cause that thing to stop working. And then there's the whole thing that, you know, when you push yourself too hard, you will end up going to the bathroom in, in the color that is like Diet Coke. It's very, very bad. You can really hurt yourself. And so if you want to, not really, but if you want to get in shape, the best thing to do is, you know what? Why don't I just get up and start walking every day? I'll just walk 20 minutes. And then I'll lose a little bit of weight. And then I'll power walk. And then maybe I'll get some bands and do some exercises with the bands. And then maybe I'll get dumbbells. And maybe I'll get to doing push-ups. And then I'll grow and I'll get to actually where I can jog. And then I can bike. And then I can actually run. And now that I've shed some pounds and got some muscle, then I'll go to something crazy like the CrossFit. Right? And so sometimes it's so intimidating. Well, you're a Christian. You need to be reading this book. Well, this thing's huge. I mean... This Bible's 1,129 pages, and they say that it's the equivalent of reading all seven Harry Potter books. It's a lot of reading here, and it's intimidating. So start small. Don't try to go to CrossFit Bible reading. Just go for a walk. And so make a goal of just reading for five minutes a couple of times a day, or a couple of, of times a week. Some of you will say, well, Nathan, that's not very much. I know, but it's better than nothing. Just open it up. Now, if you do our Proverbs challenge, you just have to read three Proverbs a week. Each chapter is about five minutes. Five minutes, three days a week, and you've got it down. And so that's the, the most common excuse is I'm not a reader. Another one is I don't have time. I hear this one a lot. I don't have time to read. Uh, time management guru, guru Brian Tracy says this, you'll never have enough time to do everything that you want to do. Nobody on planet Earth will ever have enough time to do everything that you want to do, but he says, you'll always have enough time to do what is important. And when something's important, you schedule it. And so here are a couple things you can do. You can find, you know, th there are audio Bibles that you can get. And when you're commuting to work, you can put them in. Uh, maybe you have the MP3, whatever. You can get them. They're, I mean, they're on YouTube. You can buy them. But you can find audio Bibles, and you can listen to them. Another thing that I like to tell people to do is arrive to work five minutes earlier. Just set your alarm five minutes early. Get to work five minutes earlier, early, and then sit in the parking lot. Keep your Bible in your car, which is great, because then you can just bring it to church with you, right? And so it sits in your car. You go to work, and you start work at 8 o'clock, and it's 7.52. And now you've got five minutes, and you can just read one chapter. Just read. 
And another way to do it is do it after work. You get off work, go sit in your car, open it up, read, and then when you're done reading for five minutes and you're driving home, then you can meditate. You can think about what you just read. And so, look, you can find ways to make it happen. Some will say, well, I just don't understand a lot of it. And I agree with you. Try reading the book of Jeremiah or Isaiah with no context. Start with the easier books. You might say, well, which books are easier books? Ask someone. Ask someone you know. Ask me. Ask your, if you're part of a small group, ask your small group leader. But I think that, that Mark, James, Genesis, 1 Corinthians, Proverbs, these are good places to start. But just go in and just take that first little baby step. And some would say, well, yeah, but I get really bored. It's a discipline. You've got to keep at it. It's just five minutes. And so a practical and primary way to live a life that is infused with wisdom is to read, study, memorize, and meditate on the Scripture. And so at the end of the day, you and you alone have to decide if you are going to heed the call of Lady Wisdom and rub shoulders with her through the text. Now here's another practical takeaway. That we can move from milk to meat. If you have your scripture open to Proverbs 9, verse 2, it says that she has prepared meat. Now, in a story, in this story, Lady Wisdom has prepared this this feast, and there's lots of meat there, but as 21st century Americans, we don't really realize the significance of this. Look, in the ancient world, um, they didn't eat meat very often. We eat it usually every day, and in our culture, even poor people can go to McDonald's and get the the two burgers for $2.50 or whatever, right? If you want to call that meat. But in the ancient world, eating red meat like lamb or something would have been uncommon. Um, Mostly every day they would have have eaten bread, uh, you know, with olive oil infused in it, obviously fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes, maybe some fish, depending upon where they live. Meat was reserved for special occasions, weddings, holidays, feasts, something big. And so the fact that Lady Wisdom has prepared meat is that this is going to be a big, rich, lavish meal. And we find this in the New Testament. It doesn't use the word meat. It uses the word solid food, where Paul, the writer of Hebrews, and Peter draw a contrast between milk and solid food. That milk is for babies, but when you grow, then you move to solid foods. And so uh, Paul says it this way. He says, I, filled you, I fed you milk, not solid food, because you were not able to receive it. In other words, you're still a, spiritually a toddler you can't, or, a, or a newborn. You can't eat the meat. And then the writer of Hebrews says it this way. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. And then Peter says it this way. Like newborn infants, the desire, they desire the unadulterated spiritual milk. And so what the, what the scripture is talking about is contrasting elementary learning versus advanced learning. It's contracting, uh, contrasting arithmetic versus a trigonometry. Now, I want you to imagine that you had a friend who was going to college, and you said, hey, what, you know, what are you taking at the JC? And they said, oh, yeah, I'm taking uh, intro to math. I'm, I wasn't very good at math. Okay, cool. Yeah, everyone needs to learn. There's nothing wrong with learning arithmetic, right? And so you run into your friend five years later. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm still at the JC. What are you taking? Math. Oh, you're serious about this. So where are you now? Uh, you know. Trigonometry, uh, what? Where? Uh, no, I'm still in arithmetic. You've been taking arithmetic classes for five years? Yeah. We would say, it's, that's, that's kind of weird. Something's wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with learning uh, addition and subtract and multiplication and division, but at some point we have to move past that and grow. And so we have to go deeper. So let me give you a couple of things, uh, ways that we can grow deeper. The first one is that we can grow deeper in our devotional life. Maybe you're at the point right now where you're reading five minutes a couple of times a week, and that's great. That's like arithmetic. That's the starting point. But can we move to the next level? You know, there are, are Bible reading plans that you can get online. They have one-year Bible reading plans. You might think, that's, that's a little too much. They even have two-year Bible reading plans. All you do is you print out a piece of paper, it tells you what to read every day, and you'll have read the Bible in two years. Um, You can add uh, worship into your commute. You know, a lot of people in church, one of the biggest things that you have, the problems you have in churches, is that there's always this conflict with music. Well, I like hymns. Well, I like choruses. Well, I like Caleb. I like the alternative. Everyone has their own choice. You know what the cool thing about worship is? You have 100% control of the worship music that you listen to when you're worshiping on your own. 
You get to be, the, the fight's over. You get to pick it. You get the order of service. You get the style, the authors. You get to choose all of that. And the, you like Gaither, you listen to Gaither. You like the hymns, listen to the hymns. You like Caleb, listen to Caleb. But you can go and, and worship on your own. And so there is a sense of going deeper into our devotional life and not just relying upon Sunday morning. We can go deeper by attending a small group. Look, I think that all Christians need to have a large group and a small group experience. A large group, when you come together and someone's teaching and, and, and worship is being played and you're part of a group and you're doing it together, but then also a smaller group where you can ask questions. You can interact with the text. And we've got Sunday morning Bible studies at 9.30 uh, here, and we have family night on Wednesday, and uh, we've had various uh, adult small groups throughout the week, and, and sometimes we create them by response. And so enough people say, hey, I want to do this, then we do it. You can go deeper by being proactive. Um, you know, you can really be proactive on Sunday mornings. Show up, take notes, read ahead. You know, read ahead about what the guy's going to talk about. Be here at 1030. Open up your bulletin. See what's going on. Read ahead. Be prepared to worship. Come in. Have your heart already set. Be ready to meet with God. And you can do the same thing in your small group. Do your homework. Read ahead. Take notes. Come prepared with questions. But then we can also go deeper by serving. You know, I have uh, several friends and acquaintances over the years that have gone through recovery ministries. And one of the things that I, you know, I've never gone through it, um, so I don't know exactly how it works, but I know that the first step is you get in there and you start, you start working on this stuff. But then a, a later step of maturity is that you then become a mentor. And so you turn around and you were receiving from this, uh, this group and now you turn around and now you're sponsoring someone. Now you're mentoring someone. Now you're pouring into someone. And because you know this person is relying upon you, you're more likely to keep your sobriety uh, because people are relying upon you. So we can go deeper in our devotional life, life by being in a small group, by being proactive, and by serving. Now here's another thing that will help us to gain traction is that wisdom happens daily. Look what she says in Proverbs 8.34. Anyone who listens to me is happy, watching at my door every day, waiting by the posts of my doorway. She talks about watching every day. And I will say this, that a once a week relationship is a weak relationship. That if it's just we come on Sunday, we get fed and we go home, that's a weak relationship. Over and over again, we see this idea of daily meeting with God. And here's number four, that we can learn from the experts. You see, in the old world, if you wanted news, you went to the city gates. In the old world, if you wanted to talk to someone wise, you went to the city gates. In the old world, if you wanted to formalize a contract, you went to the city gates and did it in the presence of the elders. In the old world, if you wanted to learn, you always went to the city gates. Well, in Proverbs 8.3, it says that she is standing at the entry to the city at the main entrance. Lady Wisdom is there at the city gates and she's calling out. So let me ask you this. In our culture today, where are the city gates? Where do we find the experts? Where do we find the wise, the educated, the competent on any topic that we want to learn? Well, I know where it is now. It's social media. Social media is filled with so much garbage. But that's where you can find the experts. You see, uh, John Piper might have a Twitter account, right? And I can, I can follow him and I can see what he's posting. John Piper might have a Facebook account, and I can like that, and I can see what he's posting, and then when I link to it, then it takes me to his website, and on his website, there's, there's a video, there's audio, there's writing, and so I can ultimately access these experts through social media. Right now, John Piper at DesiringGod.com, I think he has something like 35 or 40 years of his sermons online, both in audio and in transcript form. And you can go and search by time. So what I'm saying is that we have the city gates and it's sitting right there in your lap. It's, it's on your phone. It's on your computer. And we have access to the experts. And so we can learn from people who are more educated, more experienced, and wiser than we are. And we can do it instantly. And sometimes when you tweet out to them, they'll even respond back to you. Now here's the last thing. Is that we have to learn to discern all of the voices. Lady Wisdom says in Proverbs 8, 6 through 10, she says that I speak of noble things and that what my lips say are right. 
in that there's nothing detestable in her speak. There's nothing perverse. There's nothing deceptive. And so we can trust her words. You see, folks, there's so much information out there that you can't trust. The world is filled with uneducated and inept preachers and teachers. People who don't know. They're not deceptive, but they don't know the Bible. They don't understand the Scripture. And they're out there trumpeting it. And they're doing it because that's what they were, they were taught. And other people are listening. Well, how do you know if they don't know it? Because if we're people of the book, then we can always discern. And there are people out there who are purposely false teachers talking about health and wealth and, and just come and give me your money so I can buy a new plane. And if you do that, then God's going to bless you. And then there's bad advice from bad counselors, bad friends, bad websites. There's so many voices out there. But wisdom's words are right, they are clear, they are perceptive, and they are from God. And this is the final thing. That true wisdom comes from the gospel. And what I mean is that, look, when we confess Christ as Lord, like the song, when we lay ourselves down, and we confess Him as Lord and Savior, we become what you would call a Christian or saved, and then He sends His Holy Spirit into us. And that is going to be the core of the source of wisdom, is having God's Spirit live within you when you submit to Him. Now look, I remember several years ago, I, well, let's see, I've spent, I think I've spent about six or seven years, no, wait, I spent 12 years of my life leading music uh, in various venues. And I spent about three and a half or four years of that time being a music pastor only, where that was my primary job. But I didn't grow up with a musical background. I, I took a couple of classes in college, you know, music theory, history of music, and a few in seminary. So I think I have like 12 units of music. But as you get more into music, you find out how really big the door is. You open a door and you see three more doors and you open another door and there's three more and it's just so much more expansive than you would think. And I, I got educated enough to know that I really don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to music. I, I can kind of fake it. And so I remember uh, when I started dating my wife, um, you know, she has a four-year degree in sacred music and she taught professionally as a piano, flute, and voice teacher. And so she knows all the theory and she grew up with it. And so when we, when we started dating, at that time, I was solely a music pastor. So we would be driving somewhere to go for a hike or go somewhere and we'd be in the car and I would just constantly drill her on music. Okay, so these intervals, like what's the... P5 mean? What is that? Or what's the difference between a key and a mode? And there's like some Dorian mode, Aeolic. I'm like, what is all this? And so I would just sit there and just, and she was like this open book. And so I would rub shoulders with her. I would just learn and learn and learn and learn. And then I would apply it to leading music. And it was just awesome to be around her because I needed the information. And she had it because we were together and we were rubbing shoulders. Uh, and so I'm still nowhere near an expert on music, but having that time uh, of just, you know, questioning her every day for a couple of years. I just learned a lot. Uh, and so look, when, when we began to take car rides with Lady Wisdom, when we began to take car rides and spend time with her, that's going to rub off. And we're going to grow, we're going to progress, and we're going to learn how to thrive in that gray area between what is right and what is wrong. And so I challenge you to begin spending time with Lady Wisdom. Begin spending time with her, and you'll see this stuff begin to rub off on you.